Now, we just sang about what it means to be united in Christ, but any group that has more than one person in it sometimes begins to struggle about how it can be united. I came across the example of some research that was done at a meeting of the Psychological, American Psychological Association. A paper was presented and at uh, a psychologist at Union College by the name of Jack Lipton and a student, a graduate student at Columbia University, they got together. I think the graduate student's name, it, it looks like baloney, but I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced. Uh, Scott Bologna. Bologna, yeah, something like that. And um, they decided that they were gonna look at some of the variables of group unity by studying 11 different orchestras and finding out how the different sections of the orchestra described each other and felt about each other. And it was very fascinating because it says they found out that the percussionists were viewed as insensitive, unintelligent, hard of hearing, yet very fun-loving. The string players, now this is across 11 different orchestras. I can see that we have orchestras and band people in the congregation. The string players were seen as arrogant, stuffy, and unathletic. The orchestra members overwhelmingly chose loud as the primary adjective to describe the brass players. Woodwind players seemed to be held in the highest esteem and they were described as quiet and meticulous, although somewhat egotistical. Uh, those are interesting findings, to say the least, but it is not just for a chuckle this morning. What I found really interesting was the survey results showed that these widely divergent personalities and their perceptions of each other, with, which were not 100% positive, then how do they come together and make beautiful music? Well, the survey said the answer is simple. Regardless of how the musicians felt about each other or viewed each other, they subordinated their feelings and their biases to the leadership of the conductor. Subordinating our biases and our feelings to the leadership of the conductor. That's the sermon for the church, folks. As long as you make sure that you understand the conductor is Jesus Christ, not the pastor that stands before you. Under his guidance, the survey said, apparently they were all he's in these orchestras, they played beautiful music. Under God's guidance, life together for such a diverse and sometimes contentious group not only can become possible, but become the very product of fruitfulness. Their music was heavenly. The church can be heavenly even with its differences when we understand that we're the body of Christ. There are no perfect people and there are no perfect churches, yet we are still called and encouraged that life together Life together can be incredible, be in harmony, and be heavenly. I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I'll read a really incredible book, and I'll read it, and I'll be all jazzed up, or I'll go to a workshop. Anybody here have to go to workshops, or pardon me, gets to attend workshops in your professional life, you know, some of that, and you'll come away, and you're so excited, and then sometimes all that excitement has kind of just drained right out of me by the time I get home. I'm pulling the car into the garage, and I'll look at my notes, and I've taken all these notes, and then sometimes I'll think, okay, that's okay, but I don't think it's going to fly in my context. And you didn't give me enough tools to interpret how to, how to use it where I am. But most likely what happens is I realize I've heard these amazing things. They've taken me to the mountaintop. We can conquer anything. We could have 2,000 in attendance in two months. You know, ooh. And then I realized, but they didn't tell me how to make it happen. They didn't give me any practical tools. So that's one of the reasons that I really like Paul's letters to both Ephesus and to Philippi. And today we're going to hear some scripture from uh, his letter to the Philippians. He sometimes writes like a preacher that has no time limit. And we know that he is a total stranger to the comma or the period, as he does one giant run on sentence in most of his work. But he takes lofty ideas, ideas such as life together and beautiful harmony, and he not only makes them practical, but he says, here's your example and here's how it happens. I have a quote up now from Richard Foster. Conversion, meaning deciding to follow Jesus, does not make us perfect. 
but it does catapult us into a total experience of discipleship that affects and infects every sphere of our living. Paul writes to the church in Philippi in the second chapter, uh, the words that we were going to hear earlier, we will now hear. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, it's in the New Testament section of your Red Pew Bible if you'd like to pull it out. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave Jesus the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. How do we become, or how do we at least try to be a cohesive and faithful and fruitful to Jesus Christ in this church? Well, first of all, it always starts with Jesus. It, Jesus is the conductor. Jesus is the one who stands before us. It's Jesus' presence through the Holy Spirit that should guide every decision, every question. We talk about that often and always. Now, Paul is a little bit tongue-in-cheek here. Did you hear that at the beginning? If you've ever felt loved, if you've ever had any compassion, if you've ever been the least little bit encouraged or consoled, if you share in each other's joy and sympathy, and of course they're sitting there, well, of course, Paul, you know, we've, we've done that. We're together. Look around you right here. You see people that have been with you in your times of pain, in your times of trouble, and that have also celebrated with you in your joy in a real way, not just jealousy or, or competition. So he says, hey, you know, if you've experienced any of that, well, yeah, of course we have, Paul. He says, then remember that you're brought together by God's call and Christ's love and the Spirit's power. That's the only way that we could call ourselves a church, is that we are brought together by God's calling, Christ's love, and the Spirit's power. And so when he says if, well, he's got them, and he's got us. Because if we've even had the little tiniest inkling of any of this, it hasn't necessarily been under our own power, even though we can be pretty good folks. It is because we love with the love of Jesus. And he says, this is what that faithfulness looks like. This is what the Jesus-lived, God-loving, spirit-people, spirit-filled people are going to act like. He says, be of the same mind. Now, he's not saying, be of the same political party. He's not saying, uh, always be Cardinals fans and there should be no Cub fans among you. He is, you know, none of that kind of stuff. When he says, be of the same mind, he is saying, be of the same mind as Jesus. That humble, self-giving, self-sacrificing Jesus. Be of the same mind. It's not about opinions, but is having the mindset to think of others. Having the same love as Christ loves, being in full accord with one mind. Life together is made possible when we are more and more transformed. So our thoughts are like Jesus' thoughts. Because then our thoughts become the things we dwell on, which become the actions we partake of. It makes a difference. Then Paul goes on, he says, now the proof is in the pudding. Or shall we say the harmony is in the orchestra. He says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. But also say, don't do anything out of fear. 
We don't have to crawl over one another or compete with one another because there isn't enough to go around. Or that some, something going after power would be helpful. And he says, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. That you seek for the other's goodwill. That you seek to put aside a little bit of yourself if it means someone else might actually be able to hear or understand a little bit more about the love of Jesus. You look to others without having to be afraid that somehow you lose out because you're already held, we're already held in the love of Christ. Life Together has all those practical applications, the chief of which is that we put others above our own wants or desires. I love this quote from Richard Foster, another one from Richard Foster. When we genuinely believe that inner transformation is God's work, meaning that when I honestly believe that God is working on you and it's not all me, that God is the one that's going to make something different in you. Parents, when you look at your children and truly believe and trust that God is at work in them, you don't have to force it in, you know, uh, that God is really active there. Then he says that God is at work and not ours. We can put to rest our passion to set others straight. Now, that doesn't mean if people are engaged in something destructive to the community or to themselves, doesn't mean being a doormat. We're going to talk some more about that in a couple weeks. But there's a difference between having to be right and get our own way and being in a relationship. And I can guarantee there's times when you're going to be absolutely positively right. But is the struggle to bring someone else under your authority important enough to lose the relationship? And look again to Jesus about how we're going to act. And, you know, we can have lots of lofty theories and formal doctrines of the faith, but then what happens when we're out on the street? Literally, this Thursday afternoon, some of you probably read this on my Facebook page, uh, got home from a, a conference in Columbia. It was a beautiful day. I was a little bit tired, but I thought, you know what? It's a beautiful day. I am going to be happy, and I am, you know, I'm going to go fill up my car with gas. I'm going to go see my dog. I can't wait. And I was going down Fifth Street. And I noticed that there were three really young boys, probably eight or nine years old, playing on skateboards by St. John's. And so I slowed down and slowed down and slowed down. Now, I could have started honking, right, or stuck my head out of the window and said, get out of the street, you idiot, you're going to get run over, you know, or something awful like that. But I did not do any of that. I just smiled. And then they finally saw me, and they said, oh, and two went to one side, and then another one went to my right side. So I rolled down my car windows, and I said, that looks like so much fun. You must be having a blast. And the little cherub to the right of my car came back with the most filthy, vulgar response to me and flipped me the international sign of dis disgust. Now, I, I'll be honest, you know what my first response was? It was like Kathy Bates in Fried Green Tomatoes. Why are they being so mean to me? Oh, my God, I didn't do anything. They don't have to act like that. You know, but then I thought, you know what? I got the right to just go snatch that little booger ball-headed. Um, <laughs> which would probably have landed me in jail. And I'm really trying hard to get out of St. Charles without getting arrested, uh, for your honor and for mine. <laughs> but, but the reality was this. I thought, what he did wasn't right. And I have rights to say something. And then I thought, well, do I want to escalate the ugliness of the situation? Nah, not really. And I remembered what Jesus would do. But then what really made me laugh was I remember what Elijah did when some kids were giving him trouble. And if you don't know that story, go home and look it up. It's really good. And then I was able to laugh and keep going. Anybody know that story? Elijah the prophet was getting some ugly words from him, some kids, so he just asked God to send the bears out of the wood, and the bears came out and ate them. So, uh, <laughs> folks, sometimes it's good to know your biblical stories, okay? Uh, but, the, but the point was, even if you're dealing with a little kid, you know, sometimes you've got to take the higher road. You know, you got, I, I do admit it would be kind of fun if they showed up here as visitors before I leave, but no. Okay. okay. Why and what makes us capable of this life together? Paul gives us a really beautiful image. And he, first he says, you know, you've already experienced some of the greatness of what it means to be in community. So continue to improve in what it means to be in community 
as you put others first. He says, and I'll tell you how you do it because Jesus did it for you. And then he gives this imagery. And he says, you know, Jesus, part of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, this, the triune God in this beautiful, inclusive, mutual love was willing to rip itself apart, to separate for a time so that God could be incarnate on earth so that Jesus could walk among us and show it what it was like. The one who was willing to give up all the rights, all the power, all the, all the temptation to come down and grab us by the ear and jerk us over to where our mothers are and, and say, tell this boy to do something different. Instead, Jesus let go of all that as a way to teach and to show. He wasn't a motivational speaker, but instead the one that was in the streets and in the homes and showing us how to humbly live together. And he put himself as the servant. What a sacrifice for us and what an example. And then understanding that as people of the resurrection, that same power can be part of our lives together. The call on our life, as Paul said, is to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. That does not mean that you can save ourselves. None of us can do that. And your pastor can't do it for you either. But what it does is bring back again and say, remember, the Holy Spirit is in you. God is in you. So let it show on the outside. Let, let the way that you've been formed in your mind and in your spirit and in the center of who you are and make sure your outside matches your inside and in all of your activities. And it begins, and we'll go back to the word that the, the researchers found, regardless of how the musicians view each other, they subordinate their feelings and biases to the leadership of the conductor. And under his guidance, they play beautiful music. Jesus shows us over and over again that a life that is entirely directed by God in a very real sense, it means that we can be faithful in relationships, that love in a way never quits and continues to work to set things right. Notice that. It doesn't say just be a doormat. It doesn't say that that means everything is okay, but certainly works also to set things right. That in our relationship, in our community, we can be humble enough to seek God's direction in all of life. We can entrust ourselves to God's goodness and the steadfast love and faithfulness and being willing to take risks to follow God's way. We can live in harmony with God's will and God's justice and God's mercy. We can embrace the act of humility by giving ourselves away in sacrificial love. We saw that Jesus was able to do all this. And don't forget, Jesus was fully human and it wasn't any easier for him to love God and follow God than it is for us. So yes, Jesus died for our sins, and yes, he died to set us free from the power of death, and he died to make it clear once and for all that God loves us. But just as importantly, Jesus died to show us how to live, and to live together when we put our ultimate trust in a life that is wholly and completely entrusted to God. So may God grant us the courage to follow his example and trust ourselves wholly and completely to the faithful God as Jesus did. May God give us the courage to put into practice not having to fix one another, even as we lift each other up. To practice, as Dallas Willard said, the discipline of not having to have the last word, even as we seek to live in peace with one another. May God have the glory as we continue to stumble forward in this life together. Amen. I invite you to stand.